Hello, everybody. Um, Michael Silber here, event director for the Inlet Australia Conference. Um, uh, continuing with our series of discussions with uh, industry leaders. Uh, my guest today is a, um, uh, a good friend of Inlet Australia. He's a member of our advisory board and he's a director of uh, Etrog Consultant. Uh, I should point out that he'll be moderating a very important session at our live event in July when he'll be moderating uh, our, our retail overview, including um, participants from Energy Australia and Origin. Um, so um, David, David Prins from Etra Consultant, welcome. Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, always good to talk to you. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to talk with you today. And um, it, it makes up somewhat for the fact that we haven't been able to do a live event in person. Um, but we're definitely looking forward to the conference really happening in July this year, all being well. Yeah, it's, um, I have to say, David, there's a lot of pent up demand for a live event. So we're expecting a, a, real, a really vibrant and lively uh, couple of days, um, especially since we'll be one of the first major events back. Uh, so why don't we start um, uh, uh, this interview? I want to ask you about something very broad. Uh, what do you see as the two or three biggest trends currently in um, electricity retailing? Yeah, thanks for that question, Michael. Um, I think in terms of um, electricity retailing, the first thing I would say is customer involvement. Um, there's always been a range of involvement of customers uh, from low to high. There's a spectrum as there is in many things. Some people have very, very low involvement. They hardly read the bill and pay it. And other people are tinkering all the time with what they use and when they use it and what tariff they're on and which retailer they should be with. And that's always been the case. Uh, well, competition has only come in relatively recently. Um, but what's actually happened is that the high involvement end of the spectrum, I would say, has changed beyond recognition. Um, so there's, there's what now amounts to more or less a cliche, which is the consumers are now prosumers. Uh, but there's a lot that sits behind that word and sits behind uh, that makes it not just a cliche. Um, really, the customers previously didn't do much other than switch sockets on and off, uh, switch appliances on and off when they wanted it. And if they made investment choices, there was not that much to choose from. You could choose whether to have a more efficient appliance uh, that may cost a bit more, but would save you more in electricity over time. And you could invest in simple things like time switches if you're on a time of use tariff to put your washing machine on at night. Um, but now with solar PV being almost ubiquitous in Australia, um, with possibly um, customer level storage as an option, though it's a bit expensive at the moment, that may change. I'm not necessarily agreeing that customer level storage is the best answer, but that's, uh, <laughs> that's for another time, I think. Um, and, and the range of use of electricity is changing. Uh, the future of gas is uncertain. Uh, so it's likely electricity will become more and more of the dominant or only um, supply of energy to the home. And the electrification of transport, yeah, it's been slow taking off in Australia uh, with electric vehicles, but it's coming. So I'd say that the first of the, the two or three um, trends would be customer involvement. Um, the second one, I would say, is, is the transition to zero carbon, uh, which is customer led um, in the sense that customers themselves are saying we expect companies that we deal with um, to, to have um, targets for zero carbon. It's not even low carbon anymore. It's zero carbon. And in, in all kinds of space, an IT supplier can't go and get a contract anymore uh, without filling in in its tender form uh, what its um, commitment is to zero carbon. Um, it's just all over everyone. Of course, energy use is, um, is part of that. So that's hitting the retailers in terms of um, how they do their energy procurement. It used to be just about financial hedging. We didn't really care where the electrons came from. It was just a financial accounting exercise. Um, with customers caring more about um, the environmental impact, that's all changed. And I think the third way that um, things have changed um, is government intervention. 
intervention, I should say, government intervention. Now, some would say that isn't new. Some would say ever since governments were invented, they've intervened and poked their, their, their hands and face and nose and everything else into industries where they may or may not be wanted. Um, but it's increasing. And, and for instance, we've got the um, default market offer and Victorian default offer, which is reintroducing um, price regulation, where we thought we had seen the end of that because of the retail competition. Uh, we're seeing the New South Wales government with its roadmap, the Victorian government with its massive energy stimulus. Um, and I'd say that, that um, all these things aren't just increased government intervention. Um, and it's state and territory governments as well as national. I'd say that governments have been emboldened, that actually um, they feel it's more their territory now to get involved in what they want to get involved in, and they don't feel any reticence over that. So I think that sort of, hopefully that answers your question of, 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 of I think, three big trends in the retail space. Yeah, it sure does. Um, thanks for that. You, the word customer came up frequently in your la in that response. Uh, and uh, you have mentioned um, trust, the word trust to me in the past when speaking of electricity customers. Tell me, why did customers lose trust in the industry, in the electricity industry? Um, yeah, that's a really good question as well. Um, uh, the, one, one phrase that answers it is the loyalty tax. So the loyalty tax has had uh, much written on it in Australia and elsewhere that customers get taken for granted, that the best offers uh, go to the new customers. And people understood that, you know, there'd be a sign-up offer for a new customer that you could only get once, you know, if it's a free football or, or, or a, a, a movie ticket or a $50 Carl's Meyer gift card, whatever it was, people understood that you only get that once. Um, but it's got, it went way beyond that. And the ACCC inquiry of, into the retail market of course confirmed that that basically customers felt they were being taken for a ride and yeah in many cases they actually were being taken for a ride prices were rising for various reasons not all because of retailers um, but for various reasons network costs were going up generation costs were going up um, Australia was there was always the tables of comparison you see from time to time of electricity costs in various countries and Australia was going from the low end of the scale to the vast end of the scale uh, pretty quickly. Um, and then these large discounts started turning up for pay on time and they got as far as 40 percent. You know when, when they were first introduced they were far three percent, five percent, ten percent, forty percent. I mean really and then people got to understand that it was actually 40 percent taken off a number that the retailer thought of themselves. You know, where was it going to end? Well, we, we, we weren't going to get 100% off, but you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, you can, you can put a, and, and that's, of course, means I don't trust these people anymore. And, you know, the main thing I care about, not the only thing, the main thing you care about as a customer is the price. And you can't trust them. You don't know what price they're setting. They're making up a number, and then they're telling me this massive discount off the number. You know, if I say I want a bigger discount, they'll just put up the number in the first place. I've got no trust. Not only that, but don't actually trust that any other retailer is going to do any difference. Um, they're all the same. That's, yeah. that's the customer, was the customer perception at the time. They can all make up their own number. And then there were the cases of people actually moving to another retailer for a lower price. Uh, and then discovering that even before the switching process had changed, the price had gone up. And by the time they actually started with the new retailer, they were paying more than they were paying with the old retailer in what's quite an opaque industry in terms of its complexity. People just put their hands up and said, we give up, you know? And, and that's exactly, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that's, that's a, that, if that doesn't lead to lack of trust in the industry, I don't know what would. Yeah. You guys have been overcharging me by 40% all along or more, so. Well, yeah, and of course, you, when you discover this, you tell your friends, um, and they tell their friends, and you tell your Facebook page and, and, and your followers and your Twitter page, and the newspapers pick it up and the social media pick it up. It's just a downward spiral. Yeah. Um, you know, bad news travels really fast these days. And, and, and as well, it should in this case. But so is the industry doing anything? Are they performing better uh, in rebuilding trust? Are they taking any actions to rebuild trust uh, with the consumers or customers? Yes. 
Well, <laughs> I, I, I could sort of take the view that says um, they're being required to do so rather than they necessarily took the initiative to do so. I mean, following the ACCC report, things had to give. And one of the things that was put in place was the DMO, uh, the default market offer, um, in places where there is competition to set the price against which all other offers have to be compared in Victoria because it's not signed up to the uh, uh, the NER on the national rules, the retail rules, um, has to have a different mechanism in place because Victoria just has to be different, um, called the, the Victorian default offer. And there's some differences between the two, but essentially they serve the same purpose. Mm -hmm. um, they um, set a benchmark against which all offers have to be um, compared. So given that I've said earlier that that was one of the key reasons for mistrust, um, making that change uh, was addressing that. But that wasn't a change that was invented by the retailers. That was put in place by the um, ACCC recommendation and, and the Thwaites inquiry in Victoria, um, leading to AER and, in the case of Victoria, ESC action to actually uh, put that in place. I mean, that, that's the first thing. And, and, and lo and behold, when that's put in place, these 40% offers just disappear. Yeah. Uh, and the people, of course, who were, who were gaining from the 40% offers were really upset now because the people who on the ball and knew that if they got a 40% offer for six months' time had diarised that they were going to change to another retailer when that happened and weren't going to get caught out by going to the full price, the real, real involved people, oh, they're not happy because they've lost. But what they actually lost was something that they were only getting because it was at the expense of other customers. Right. Um, so right. definitely fairness has been improved. Um, and, you know, I think that, that that's a key thing. Um, and um, other things that, that I'm seeing, there's more retailers being upfront about price changes, um, not just telling you after it had happened. Some of that's required. Some of it may be going to be above and beyond what's required. Um, also that um, I always use the benchmark of what an electricity retailer should be providing as other retailers. What do we nowadays expect as consumers from other retailers? What do we expect from the supermarkets? What do we expect from the department stores? What do we expect from the banks? Everybody else who sells to us. Uh, one of the key things is digital offerings. Um, you know, we expect not to just um, call a help desk and, and, and wait an hour in the queue uh, at hours that suit them. We expect 24 seven, um, you know, in an app, online, in Facebook, wherever it might be, um, we, we expect that. Now, look, there is a digital divide of people who actually aren't digitally savvy who are being left behind, but that's true of all retailers as well. And things need to be done uh, to cover those people too. But just in general, uh, what retailers are doing themselves is catching, electricity retailers is doing, is I think catching up with the non-energy retailers in terms of how they do um, customer involvement and, um, and customer offerings. Well, listen, even incremental change is uh, better than nothing, right? So oh, yeah. we're happy with that. So switching gears completely, um, uh, as you know, in late Australia is, is uh, focused on the energy transition. So what is the impact of the energy transition on the Australian market in particular? I could give you a one word answer, Michael, which is huge. <laughs> well, elaborate um, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, but you actually expect me to expand on that, I'm sure. A little bit. Um, yes, but it is huge. Um, I think number one is, is the fact that it is, as we said earlier, a customer-led revolution. It is a revolution and it is customer-led. And people uh, decry the fact that we haven't had a coherent energy policy from national government for some time, um, ever since there was a carbon tax and then that was removed. Um, but it's customer-led. Customers are calling the shots. Some of the jurisdictional governments as well. So the fact that there isn't... Um, uh, policy nationally is just not stopping the transition and not stopping the enormity of the transition. Um, the duck curve is, is well known, the change in the shape of load that now there's this big cutout in the middle of the day when the sun's shining and all this solar PV on, is on. I mean, that does a lot of things in terms of um, changing how people are being encouraged to use energy. Um, 
but really one of the key things stems from the fact that um, our networks were built to be radial, um, to take uh, energy from A to B, from the big centers of generation where you had this big coal uh, generating plants, or you had a series of them like the Latrobe Valley um, outside Melbourne. We have all the generation, and then you have lots of big transmission lines taking that energy to the load center in Melbourne and beyond to uh, the other parts of the state. And then we sort of progress from that to interconnectors, to interconnect large loads between different states. Um, but all that's changed. If your energy is distributed um, here, there, and everywhere, you need different types of connections than you had before. Um, and network um, augmentation uh, and network build is costly. Um, so that's having a major impact. Um, that's on the network side, on the actual energy side. Uh, so we have this truism that we can't store energy. We can't store electricity, I should say, which isn't true anymore. Well, never was. It, it, we always could store it, but we couldn't store it efficiently in bulk. So what we did was we stored proxies. We stored energy in different ways. So we stored hot water or we stored the water up the hill and then let it down the hill. Um, in regard to hydro. Now with battery storage becoming uh, much cheaper and much more efficient, things are changing. Uh, the investment in batteries in Australia and elsewhere is enormous. You know, people thought that the, that the first battery that went in in South Australia was big, but then, you know, you're getting batteries only a year or so, two or three later, they're going to be 10 times as big <laughs> as the biggest ever. <laughs> And that's the that's the size and that's the way in which we're transitioning and moving. Um, so yeah, firming of um, of, of uh, non dispatchable load using storage because um, you know you can dispatch your old coal fire station. You can't dispatch the sun or the wind. Um, uh, we're sitting here in the middle of summer in Australia, where it's about thirty one or so degrees outside where I am probably similar where you are. We forget that in the Northern Hemisphere, it's actually winter. And I'm reading stories over the past 24 hours about how Europe and parts of the USA are covered in snow. There's massive heating loads on the electricity system and all the solar PV is covered in snow. Um, as are some of the wind turbines. Um, <laughs> well, in fact, um, I, I know Texas quite well. I actually worked there for a number of years and um, they've never seen snow before. And what's happening is um, the, the politicians who are just are clinging to coal are trying to blame you know, the wind turbines frozen over, which is not the case. The, the problem is that there's no gas. There's a gas shortage because they weren't equipped to provide all that gas for heating homes. That's the issue. It's not about um, clean energy, which is unfortunate yeah. that that's becoming um, uh, becoming the central talking point over this crisis in, in Texas in particular. Um, so I'm going to uh, sum this, uh, finish this interview by asking you, um, has there been any fundamental change in the industry as a result of the pandemic? Um, definitely, yes. I mean, we've all felt change. We've all had our um, daily uh, work and social lives uh, completely changed. And so that has, has changed a lot. So first of all, we see it in the change in the electricity usage. Uh, the, the central business districts have been virtually closed. Uh, there's more residential use. Um, the timing of usage has changed because people are getting up a bit later, uh, maybe having dinner a bit earlier because they're not coming home uh, so late from work, so that's changed the load shape. Um, of course, we changed because we're losing conferences like Inlet that, that we haven't been able to go to. Um, people have got financial difficulties. People who've never had financial difficulties before have got financial difficulties. People who've never had an affordability issue suddenly do because they thought they had secure jobs, but the money isn't there to pay them. Uh, so. Um, the, there's a, the, the AER has stepped in and said people shouldn't be disconnected. So there's a lot of debt uh, building up with the electricity retailers. There's a lot of uncertainty about how and when and how much of that debt uh, will be collected and when. Uh, we're starting to see a bit more uh, M&A activity, mergers and acquisitions of some of the energy retailers, which we hadn't seen so much of in recent years, I think we can expect some of the smaller ones uh, to be picked up by larger retailers who have more of a portfolio 
and more of a capability to get um, uh, to deal with um, some of the issues of COVID and, and transition and all the other things that are going on. Um, and in the long term, I mean, those are all sort of short term things we're already seeing. In the long term, the simple answer is we don't know, because we don't actually know what's going to happen with COVID. Uh, one scenario that I was reading about yesterday is it's going to be more like a flu model, where you have a vaccine, uh, but because the virus mutates, uh, you have to get the virus each year, it's not 100% effective. Um, and um, unfortunately, people do die of the flu every year. And we might just live with that, but we won't be locking down every time. We don't lock down. We may lock down an old age home and not allow visitors in because of because of flu. That's happened in the past. But we won't be locking down whole cities and states because a few people have been diagnosed with the flu. Mm. And maybe you know, if COVID isn't so severe because vaccines have largely um, covered it, maybe that's what we're heading to. But if we are heading to, and that will sort of become more of a business as as normal we're used to but you know don't know when that's going to happen or if it's going to happen if people are going to be more isolated less international travel less domestic travel that's all going to change um things in in the whole industry um and i think that um covid has also started causing a lot of people to think more about you know what's the meaning of life yeah you know, why am i here yeah. Is it really about the rat race of going to do to work every day just to be able to pay for you know what we need as a family and a bit of enjoyment and then I have to go back to work again and eventually I'll I'll, I'll die, you know? Yeah. Other people are actually changing. You know, do I have to live in the city because my work's there, work remotely, revitalize regional rural areas, even change country because you know we've reassessed and people might be more interested when when immigration comes back to Australia to see, you know, we're, we're a relatively healthy country compared to a lot of the world. Maybe that would become more important. Um, and just, you know, the role of the city as in terms of, um, as against regional rural, that all um, ties in with what we were saying earlier about network build and yeah. all that kinds of things. Yeah. Um, I think it's all about, at the moment, flexibility. Uncertainty means you have to be flexible and agile. Yeah. Right. And therefore, the retailers, amongst others, are actually having to become more agile than they ever were in the past. Well, um, as always, David, fascinating conversation with you. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing you, as we were talking about in July, moderating our, our retail panel, which will have uh, two big time experts um, uh, discussing the issues of the day, which by July, I'm sure will change. But uh, again, uh, thanks for your time. Uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, hopefully before July, but definitely in July. Yep. Thank you, Michael. Also look forward to, to July, if not sooner. Thanks a lot. Okay.